So good afternoon to everybody. Today we will continue with uh, some special topics of neutron imaging using uh, energy selective uh, option at steady state sources. And uh, after that, Robin will present uh, the same technique at uh, pulsed sources like uh, spallation sources uh, at ESS, uh, SNS, and, and so on. So um, I'll start with uh, the consideration here that uh, um, the wave uh, particle duality is the concept in quantum mechanics that uh, every particle may be partially described in terms not only of particles, but also of waves. Uh, in this way, actually the, uh, the particles, the material particles like uh, neutron uh, also can be represented as a wave propagation. So it has uh, wave properties. Uh, and uh, we can assign wavelength and frequency to uh, neutrons with certain uh, energy. So um, um, therefore it is possible to um, plot such diagrams uh, where we have the energy, energy distribution of neutrons coming from the neutron source or the so known spectrums, spectra. Uh, in terms of uh, not only of energy, but also of neutron wavelengths as shown here. So we see here the representation in neutron wavelengths of thermal and cold spectrum, which were measured at, uh, at the source FRM1 in Munich when I was a PhD student there. So um, we see the broadening of the cold neutron spectrum in the direction of the uh, longer wavelengths. So this means uh, lower energies. In addition to this, uh, we can see that uh, the transmission properties of polycrystalline materials like uh, iron here, uh, iron material, um, is also uh, influenced uh, from the uh, wave nature of the neutron in order that um, the um, strong changes in the transmission can be related to diffraction uh, contrast. This means that um, the, the wavelength of the neutrons is in the range of the latest spacing in the polycrystalline material or in the crystalline material. And therefore, uh, for certain wavelengths, we can expect also diffraction. And uh, the diffraction signal is actually not recorded uh, by the neutron imaging detector. So that's why we have some loss of intensity. Um, as uh, shown here of transmitted intensity through the sample. But I'll go in details uh, in detail to this uh, later. So how this looks like when we image, when we make an image of polycrystalline material at a certain wavelength, for example, here at around four angstrom, we see that there is a very strong change in the transmission property uh, of, the, of the material, or this is actually the attenuation coefficient shown here. So we have very rapid and big change of the attenuation coefficient for iron around four angstrom. And um, uh, here is a, an example of uh, radiography at four angstrom of a weld between two uh, steel plates where actually um, the structure of the weld uh, can be seen uh, quite well. So the contrast, what we are observing here can be related to diffraction contrast due to the fact that in areas where we see some dark um, contrast or let's say where we lose intensity, in these areas uh, we have some diffraction where the neutrons which are going for, uh, which are scattered from their uh, primary trajectory 
are lost uh, for the imaging uh, process and therefore we see we observe um, some decreased intensity for these areas. For example, you can see here and here and here and so on. So um, of course, um, we have some, we cannot have perfect uh, monochromatization of the beam. So we have some uh, wavelength resolution where uh, actually the, the delta lambda is the spectral broadening of the beam. The spectral broadening depends on the way of neutron monochromatization or how we select certain wavelength from the polychromatic neutron beam or from the white beam coming from the neutron source. There are different ways of monochromatization. I think Robin spent uh, yesterday some time on this, but here I'll mention them again. So these uh, methods for monochromatization are typical for steady state sources, for example, velocity selector or double crystal monochromator. And here I'm showing also the time of flight method, which is um, typical for uh, post sources, but it can be also implemented at steady state sources using choppers. So we have continuous beam coming from the steady state source. And then with choppers, we can chop the beam in pulsed sequences, or we have some pulsed uh, beam structure, uh, which actually propagates. And with the time, we have uh, just extension of the, uh, of the pulse, where actually the faster neutrons or the shorter wavelengths are arriving first at the detector and uh, the low energy or longer wavelengths are arriving later. So um, the very important feature here is that we are uh, needing, or it, it, it is essential to have a, a detector which can take uh, pictures in very short times in order to make the discrimination between different uh, neutron wavelengths. So um, I'll focus uh, on every of these kind of methods for monochromatization, starting with the velocity selector. So this is how the velocity selector looks like. It is a turbine which rotates at about um, 2,000 uh, 2, 2, 2, 2, revolutions per minute. And it can select actually certain wavelength because um, it allows neutrons of defined velocity to pass uh, to pass through the through these channels of the blade of the turbine blade, uh, turbine. So these channels are defined uh, by this lamella or uh, by the blades of the selector. And then at certain velocity of rotation, we can accept one velocity of neutrons passing just through this uh, like a screw shaped uh, structure. So in this way, we can, we can uh, just, uh, just um, set conditions which are um, where uh, only certain velocity from the neutron beam is accepted. And at the end, uh, we have just transmission for neutrons with this certain velocity. This means that we can select certain wavelength from the, uh, from the beam. So um, the, um, these uh, blades or this lamella are manufactured uh, by, uh, are uh, just manufactured by very light material like, um, um, for example, uh, some plastic material, which is uh, coated with a strongly uh, neutron absorbing um, material like uh, boron 10. So uh, every neutron which hits uh, these blades will be uh, absorbed. And in this way, we, um, uh, we get the chance 
only of uh, get the chance for neutrons having a defined speed to transmit uh, this uh, selector. So you can see here on the image how the experiment uh, arrangement looks like. We have a neutron guide uh, where the, the neutrons are transported to a certain position. So uh, this is the velocity selector. It is very compact turbine. And here it is the detector with the sample in front of it. By changing of the angle of the velocity uh, selector in respect to the beam, we can tune actually um, the wavelength um, resolution and uh, select a broader or narrower spectrum uh, coming uh, from, from, from the beam. So um, this method is uh, quite good when we need uh, actually high intensity and low wavelength resolution. So uh, as you can see here on the bottom, so uh, the resolution of this method is about uh, between 15 and 30%, which is quite, let's say, uh, bad resolution. But we transmit uh, quite a large number of neutrons because we are accepting quite broad um, uh, energy band uh, for our experiment. So uh, this method uh, is very beneficial if we are needing actually uh, a lot of uh, intensity and we can just relax uh, the condition for monochromacity. So some methods uh, don't need really very strong or very, uh, very defined wavelength uh, for, uh, for the uh, experiment. So for such kind of experiments, we can uh, use this method. The next uh, device which can be used for monochromatization is, is the double crystal monochromator. And uh, here we can improve the resolution down to three to 10%. So uh, here we have much better wavelength resolution due to the fact that we are using two monochromators or two monochromatic, mono, uh, uh, usually two single crystals. But uh, in order to gain a bit more intensity and relax the, the, uh, the resolution, we can use monochromators uh, with a certain mosaicity. This means that uh, we have uh, just uh, not a single crystal, but um, combination of small crystallites, small single crystals, which have some uh, preferential orientation, but they are misaligned a bit um, uh, if, we, if we consider them uh, as a plane. So this means that um, the misalignment between the crystals is can be in the range of 0.8 to 3.5 degrees in respect to the surface of the monochromator. So in this way, uh, we can um, um, we can um, make the um, the um, the um, uh, how to say uh, the band or the um, uh, beam uh, spectral, um, the, the, the band spectrum, which is transmitted or reflected from the crystals much broader. And um, in this case, uh, reducing um, the, um, the wavelength resolution, we can gain more intensity. So if we use a single crystal monochromator, uh, then uh, the resolution will increase and will become uh, below uh, 1%. But uh, with the mosaicity of the crystals, we decrease the resolution, let's say, and gain more intensity, which is uh, very important for uh, neutron uh, imaging experiments where uh, the intensities are not uh, very high. 
So the uh, how uh, this device works, actually from the polychromatic beam, we reflect with the first crystal a certain wavelength, which is um, uh, dependent on the orientation of the crystal or rotation of the crystal. So uh, using different rotation angles here, we can select uh, different wavelengths uh, from one to six angstrom using uh, pyrolytic graphite monochromators. And then with the second crystal, we can um, double reflect the, the beam and keep the same beam uh, orientation as the initial beam, uh, which is coming from the, from the reactor. In this way, just by rotating the crystals and translating uh, the second analyzer crystal, it is possible to set um, wavelengths from one to six angstrom, for example, continuously. So um, uh, this means that we can perform even scans uh, by uh, just uh, setting uh, different conditions for the orientation uh, of the crystals. So this met method is very, um, um, how to say, very frequently used at uh, the steady uh, state sources, uh, neutron sources, because um, we can uh, tune um, the wavelength in a quite uh, broad range. Uh, we don't need um, the, um, um, uh, let's say, a very sophisticated um, a, a controlling system for a velocity selector where we, you need a vacuum and uh, also uh, water cooling for the velocity selector here. Uh, we have a quite simple mechanical device, which is very robust. And uh, even here we can tune the wavelength resolution by changing the crystals and using different mosaicity. So um, for the time of flight method, which I uh, already mentioned that can be used also even at steady state sources, we need a pulsed beam, which can be just uh, produced from the neutron source if it's a pulsed neutron source or using choppers at the, at the steady state neutron source. And uh, this pulsed beam is propagating uh, uh, at a certain distance where actually it, uh, it, call, it, it is transmitting the samples. And uh, behind that, we have a time resolved or a, a, um, detector with very high time resolution, which can take pictures in very short time. Uh, and after that, from this stack of collected images, we can reconstruct the wavelength where this image was taken uh, at. So here you can see we are in the range of microseconds. So uh, this experiment, performed experiments from Anton Tremsin was, um, um, uh, was performed with uh, multi-channel plate detector. And uh, the resolution which was achieved here is microsecond. So at the end, uh, we are able to um, see the change of the contrast or the transmission through the samples with very high uh, wavelength resolution of below uh, 1%. So you can see here that with this method, we can achieve resolution of 0.1 to 1%. So Robin will uh, go into detail after, after my talk and just focused, uh, will focus in this method and give you uh, a lot of examples. So how this met this uh, different uh, types of monochromatization uh, uh, look like when we compare them. So here you see uh, the transmission through uh, iron plate, where actually the neutron monochromatization was performed with velocity selector, double crystal monochromator with mosaicity of 3.5 uh, degrees, and double crystal monochromator with uh, improved um, mosaicity or less mosaicity of 0.8 uh, degrees. So you see that with the velocity selector having um, 
uh, wavelength resolution of about 13 uh, of 15 to 30 percent, which is quite uh, bad. We have quite smeared spectrum or transmission spectrum, or here are the attenuation coefficients actually for iron. So the wavelength dependence here is not really sharp. We have uh, roughly, we can guess the shape or where we have the very uh, strong rack cutoff uh, in the transmission. We can catch it with the, with the velocity selector. But uh, of course, the smearing of the transmission or this uh, um, rack edge curve is quite strong. Using a double crystal monochromator, we can catch even the small here um, uh, cutoffs or edges. And but uh, uh, if we compare this to the better uh, mosaic or small mosaicity of the crystals, we see that with 3.5 degrees, we have uh, much uh, more um, uh, uh, smearing of the spectrum. And with three uh, and all, with a mosaicity of 0.8 degrees of the crystals, we have quite sharp edge here, and uh, therefore this method is preferential for um, black edge uh, mapping or imaging where we want to take pictures um, uh, uh, and reconstruct uh, the black edge shown here precisely. So some examples will be given later. And here is a summary about the different methods of monochromatization. So you can see here the uh, achievable wavelength resolutions, which we have uh, with each of these methods. And also the exposure times um, at, uh, uh, at uh, imaging facilities. Uh, where we have, um, uh, where we can take one image in a range of seconds when we are using a velocity selector with a double crystal monochromator increasing the wavelength resolution. This means that the, that the uh, intensity of the monochromatic beam goes down and then we have minutes. And uh, in time of light, because of the time stamping, which uh, is necessary, just to um, be able to take um, um, position sensitive images in very short uh, exposure times, then uh, the uh, exposure is in, in the range of microseconds. <clears throat> so um, I mentioned already that in polycrystalline materials, uh, the neutron beam attenuation coefficient um, uh, may owe some of uh, its wavelength dependence to the fact that some neutrons are scattered out of the incident beam by Bragg diffraction. So in this case, um, uh, at certain wavelengths in analogy to, uh, analogy to Bragg peaks in a diffractometer, Bragg edges are observed. And the associated image, imaging method is hence often uh, termed uh, Bragg edge imaging. And it, uh, it is um, carried out using a tunable uh, monochromatic uh, neutron beam uh, at the steady state uh, neutron sources. So um, here I, I would uh, like to, sh to um, just um, remind you again how the uh, Bragg diffraction uh, with neutrons works uh, like. I guess that Robin has shown this already in his uh, lecture, but uh, nevertheless. So uh, in the neutron diffraction geometry, we have incident beam, we have a scattered neutron beam, and here uh, we have just the preservation of the moment uh, expressed here where we have uh, preservation of energy and momentum of the neutron. And uh, then, uh, of course, uh, the Bragg diffraction uh, is obeying the, um, the uh, Bragg law, where the, um, the um, lattice spacings uh, in the crystal are related to the wavelength uh, through um, 
uh, the, uh, through the angle of, uh, of the incidence angle uh, of the neutrons. So if we change uh, the latest spacing by applying, for example, uh, tension on the crystalline material, then uh, the diffraction peak will move uh, at a certain extent, and uh, it can be measured in, in a diffraction mode um, uh, where actually the residual stress analysis uh, method uh, can help us to find uh, such kind of shifts and quantitatively to estimate such kind of uh, residual stresses uh, in the crystal lattice. So um, usually uh, in the diffraction experiments, we are not interested in spatial information or in um, position sensitive information coming from the material. So we are using a scanning method so we can scan point by point and get uh, the, the scattering spectrum or the diffraction uh, spectrum for each point and then reconstruct actually the residual stress position sensitivity. Uh, sensitivity. Um, for this purpose, the detector which is used here is a counting tube, which doesn't have any, usually any uh, spatial uh, resolution. In some, um, in some instruments uh, recently, uh, these kind of detectors were replaced uh, by position sensitive gas uh, detectors where the resolution is in, uh, in the range of few millimeters. But if you are, if you are trying to extract resolution uh, in the range of uh, micrometers, as in the case of neutron imaging, then you should replace this counting tube by position sensitive detector, which we are using for imaging. And this is uh, shown here. Actually, uh, from the research reactor, uh, we are using, uh, we can select a certain wavelength uh, from the beam coming from the reactor by a monochromator. Then we are directing the monochromatic beam to the um, crystalline material. And in the diffraction experiment, we are using a counting tube to count the scattered intensity at different angles. So this is the diffractogram, which uh, at the end uh, we can use for estimation of the crystalline structure. So um, we can replace this uh, counting tube by imaging detector and just observe the scattering signal, scattered signal coming from, uh, from this kind of crystalline material position sensitively. So this was done here in diffraction configuration at um, Paul Scherer Institute when I was a PhD student. So this was one trial, how to use imaging detector in, in neutron diffraction experiments. You can see this is the monochromator uh, in this uh, drum. Uh, so the beam is directed to the sample and between the sample and the position sensitive, uh, position sensitive detector here, we have collimators in X and, y and Y direction. So we can just project the, uh, the scattered beam over the position sensitive detector. And at behind the, um, the, this uh, imaging detector, we have just the counting tube here in this, um, uh, in this container. So this means that we can measure simultaneously the, the image of the diffracted radiation and also to take the spectrum, uh, the diffracted spectrum by the counting tube. So as a sample, we used a monochromator, just one, let's say, crystal, which is reflecting, um, uh, reflecting uh, the neutron beam. And it was known that there is some mosaicity in the crystal. So this means that there are regions which are uh, scattering um, uh, the radiation under different angles because there is some misalignment of uh, different regions in the crystal. So here, this is uh, the result. So you see that uh, actually the diffraction curve has two peaks at two different angles. 
which are coming from two different regions in the in the in the monochromator, which are misaligned uh, by uh, let's say uh, one two degrees. What uh, is the uh, what is the picture uh, or what is the um, let's say map of the um, scattered radiation is shown on the bottom. This is actually the signal from uh, from uh, recorded from the uh, imaging detector, and you can see immediately uh, the areas of scattering position sensitively. So you can identify already the areas which are scattering the radiation at about uh, 43 degrees. So it's in this area. And uh, the bigger area at about uh, 43.8 uh, degrees is this one. So this means that this monochromator consists of two regions, or let's say three regions. Two of them uh, are misaligned to the central region by uh, 1.5 degrees about. So looking only at the diffraction, uh, spectrum, it is not possible to identify uh, what is uh, the distribution of these areas in the monochromat or in the this, uh, let's say, single crystal material. But um, by using Im of imaging, it is possible to see exactly which areas from the sample are uh, diffracting or reflecting. And after that, if you are if we are interested, to, for example, to cut an area which is a single crystalline, then we can we can really see from the map which area we should cut, and then we have a single crystalline material. So this was uh, quite uh, interesting, but uh, the main um, um, the main thing what we learned from here is that imaging detectors can be used in combination with uh, diffraction methods. So um, this was actually uh, application of imaging detector instead of diffraction counting tube. But uh, we can actually change a bit the geometry and use the imaging detector for a transmission. So this means uh, here we have the scattered neutrons. And if we take a picture from the sample in transmission mode, then this means that the regions of diffraction will appear as dark areas. So in this configuration, this uh, uh, actually it, uh, the uh, diffracted neutrons or the diffracting areas are seen as uh, high intensity areas because we are detecting just uh, the scattered neutrons. But in case of transmission mode or transmission geometry, these scattered neutrons are no more transmitted. So we see them as a um, um, dark uh, area. So this is the way what uh, we want uh, actually to explore. And uh, for imaging purposes, we are using the double crystal monochromator in our case. Uh, uh, and uh, then we can select one certain wavelength from the white beam coming from the reactor, as I mentioned before. So if we put some polycrystalline material in the beam, then with the double crystal monochromator, we can catch actually very precisely the shape of the um, uh, attenuation dependence of this polycrystalline material with the wavelength. And you can see here that uh, we can really uh, catch the break, the break cutoff uh, very, uh, very well, and even have a good uh, representation of the break edges at uh, different wavelengths. So, um, how uh, uh, how we can use uh, this uh, effect for imaging? So, if we take one. A sample like uh, this step wedge and put it in the beam, um, then we can observe actually very simple change in the transmission uh, before and above the break edge. 
So if we perform uh, an experiment with uh, wavelength of 4.5 angstrom and wavelength of 3.5 angstrom, you see that actually here the attenuation coefficient is, is much higher uh, than um, the attenuation coefficient above the brackage. So this means that here we have much better transmission because the attenuation is lower for iron. So this is just uh, some kind of qualitative exploration of this uh, feature of polycrystalline materials to uh, obey different attenuation coefficients and different energies. So we can extend this experiment and be more uh, consistent uh, just by taking images at different wavelengths. And you can see that, for example, for steel, which is uh, dominant or preferentially um, consists of iron, or th there is a big portion of iron, up to uh, four angstrom, we have quite strong attenuation. And above four angstrom at 4.3, the attenuation becomes um, uh, much less. So this means that here we have better transmission. So for each uh, element, we have different behavior. So for aluminum, you see that uh, here we have uh, the highest attenuation and then the uh, attenuation decreases. So this means that for each element, we can find this break edge or break cutoff at different positions, which is uh, actually the feature uh, um, that uh, can be explained this feature with the crystalline structure of the of the uh, of these metals. So um, just uh, we continue with the uh, qualitative exploration of these uh, breakage uh, effects or breakage um, um, shaped uh, transmission uh, uh, properties of the materials. And um, we can play with this and just uh, make uh, like a magic. And um, we can make that some materials lose contrast. So um, if we take copper and iron, so here in this image is very difficult to distinguish between copper and iron. They're quite similar and similar behavior. But uh, if we look at the, um, the wavelength dependence of their attenuation coefficients, we can find for two different wavelengths the same attenuation coefficient for copper, as you see here, or for iron. So this means that if we take images at these two wavelengths and divide these images uh, uh, one by the other, then uh, this means that um, due to the fact that the certain element has the same attenuation for these two wavelengths, then it will disappear. And uh, this is the case here, actually, as you see for uh, copper, it's uh, in the uh, ratio of the images of 3.4 and 4.2 angstrom, copper is disappeared. So we can make the same for iron and enhance the contrast for the other elements. For example, um, uh, here for brass and copper, we can enhance the contrast and we can make that um, iron is disappearing. And you can see that polyethylene is also disappearing because uh, it has also a very similar attenuation coefficients for the very short wavelength range of uh, less than one angstrom. So this means that playing with the wavelengths uh, qualitatively, we can change the contrast in our images and reduce or enhance the contrast uh, for, uh, for different uh, elements. It, it depends, of course, uh, on uh, what we want uh, to enhance. So, um, sorry, I'll, I'll go back to the chat and just I saw that uh, there are a few questions. So uh, here, um, the question about um, 
the the world. Uh, I'll go back to the uh, to this example later when I'm uh, showing the reason for the black edges. So um, the ratio of two images is just division. So we take uh, two images at two different wavelengths. And uh, after that, we divide these images uh, uh, one by the other. And uh, in this case, uh, the transmission will be the same for the element, um, uh, the same for the two wavelengths uh, if the attenuation coefficient is the same. So this is just a division of the pictures. So um, here we can uh, use this change of the contrast uh, in order to enhance some structures uh, in different samples. So this is uh, ancient Roman brush, uh, which uh, was uh, taken uh, um, or it, which was imaged uh, by thermal neutrons. And we can guess that there is some structure uh, inside in the brush. And um, uh, it was known that there is some incrustation in the, in the brush made by silver. So if we compare uh, the uh, attenuation coefficient for the silver and copper, we can see that increasing the wavelength, actually the attenuation properties uh, of copper and silver just um, um, are very different. And that's why at six angstrom, uh, we are able to see this structure uh, with uh, much better detail. So this is the case when we just play with the, with the wavelength. So um, I'm go going back to the chat. Are the attenuation coefficients, uh, sorry, uh, are the attenuation coefficients a different wavelength for different elements available somewhere? Yes, there is a database and also there is this uh, online calculator. I don't know if Robin has shown this to you already, but at the end of the lecture, I can demonstrate to you how you can uh, find out the attenuation coefficients for different wavelengths. Uh, there is an online library at NIST, which can be used. I, I can, uh, I showed it partly uh, yesterday, but I will also put uh, the NXS plotter actually on the Indico page so people can okay. download it with some examples as well. And what okay. the links. Yeah, yeah, good drawing, thank you. So uh, let's continue further. Uh, now I'm going to explain why we see the breakages. Probably Robin has shown this already, but I need to show it again. I mean, uh, it is for better understanding. Uh, so if we have a polycrystalline material and with a double crystal monochromator, we select a certain wavelength and set, send this wavelength to the polycrystalline material, then uh, due to the Bragg scattering in the sample, uh, some of the crystallites which are presented here and have the orientation of uh, a certain orientation to the incident beam uh, will uh, scatter um, uh, this wavelength. So um, uh, this means that uh, it will happen for a certain uh, HKL family of uh, lattice planes. Uh, and uh, by increasing the wavelength, then we're coming to the case where we have backscattering, or this is the maximum angle of orientation, let's say, to the incident beam, which we could have. So this means for this uh, HKL family of lattice spacing, the next wavelength or the wavelength which is bigger than this one will not cause any more scattered, uh, scattering in this, um, uh, in, uh, or will be not more scattered from this latest spacing in the crystal. Uh, in this way, actually, we have very strong change in the attenuation properties of the material at certain wavelengths. And these are exactly the positions where we are expecting to see actually uh, Bragg scattering uh, in diffraction experiments. 
And the positions of these uh, of these edges are at uh, if we consider that sinus from sine from 90 degrees is one. So uh, it is the double the lattice spacing in the crystal. So this means that in a transmission mode, we have some sense about the crystalline structure of our material, where the positions of the break edges are pointing out to the uh, to the wavelengths where uh, we uh, have uh, actually twice the latest spacing in the crystal. So this uh, case here is representing iron. And uh, uh, you see that the maximum, um, the maximum break cutoff is at about 4.1 angstrom. So this is the maximum, uh, two times the maximum latest uh, spacing uh, in iron crystal. So I'm coming back to the weld uh, joint here between the iron plates. And uh, this is the transmission spectrum, which we measured. Uh, no, uh, this is the just uh, the, um, the defined uh, tabulated uh, spectrum for iron. And uh, if we take pictures of this weld uh, joint at different wavelengths, we can see different pictures. Uh, so this is a 3.8, 4.0 and 4.2 angstrom. And you can see definitely that at 4.2 angstrom, we don't have any diffraction contrast more. So this means that um, here the wavelength is too broad or too uh, large in order to um, fulfill the Bragg scattering law. Therefore, here we have just pure absorption. So no more scattering from the sample. So what is the reason for these uh, structures which we observe here? So if we uh, consider, for example, um, texture in the sample. So this means that uh, for different orientation of the crystallites will have diffraction at different wavelengths. And it can be described here actually if we have a certain orientation of the crystallite at angle theta. So then uh, for different orientation of these crystallites, we'll have scattering. So we, if we consider, uh, for example, um, if we consider uh, some texture, then we can say, okay, the dark areas are corresponding for example, to 24 uh, degrees in relation to the incident beam. So we, you can just make a mapping of texture in the sample. If you don't have te texture and see such kind of changes in your sample, this means that there is some phase transition. For example, what we can expect here is that by the high temperature uh, in the welding process, we have some phase transitions and change from, for example, martensitic to austenitic state in the sample. So uh, there are different reasons for the contrast which we can observe in such kind of energy selective imaging. And uh, this uh, should be studied in much more detail, even with diffraction, pure diffraction experiments. So what we can learn actually from such kind of um, breakage imaging so what we can learn is phase transitions. So you can see here uh, from the dark or from the black curve to the uh, just uh, to the curve with the um, with the circles and the triangles, uh, we have change actually of the phase uh, from uh, I think from austenitic to martensitic state, and of course the position of the break edge is shifting with the time. So this is just uh, by heating of the sample and uh, uh, taking just uh, the transmission spectrum. The other thing which uh, we can, uh, wh where we have uh, sense is actually texture because uh, then we have change of the height of the break edge with the time. Strain uh, can be also detected if we have shift of the break edges, because as we said in the beginning, the position of the break edges can be uh, correlated uh, with the position of the diffraction peaks in diffractograms. So uh, 
as uh, it was shown in the beginning, uh, the position of the diffraction peaks uh, or the shift of the diffraction peaks can be related to some residual stresses or some uh, stress in the crystal lattice. And here it will be uh, just related uh, in this case to shift of the position of the break edges. So in order to be, uh, to be competitive to diffraction, we need here actually very good energy resolution in order to pick these very small uh, shifts of the diffraction peaks. And uh, the resolution which we are aiming in this case is just, um, for example, 0.4 angstrom which is uh, uh, quite high resolution and it can be achieved for the moment only by using of time of life method. So I'm going to several examples now. So uh, how we can uh, just uh, use this information for position sensitive mapping of uh, phase transitions in metals. In this case, it is a very famous example where Robin uh, performed uh, this nice experiment uh, here at our facility. So um, here, a trip steel was um, mechanically, um, uh, how to say, uh, it was uh, um, stressed by uh, using uh, tension and torsion. And uh, in these strip steels, we have um, phase transition for, from austenitic to martensitic state, uh, which, is, um, uh, which is dependent on the applied uh, stress, let's say, in the sample or applied uh, uh, mechanical um, pressure. So, um, what we can observe here that in this phase transition, we have change of the crystalline structure or the, of the symmetry of the crystalline structure from, uh, from example, from austenitic to martensitic from uh, phase centered um, uh, cubic structure to um, body centered uh, cubic uh, structure. So this means that the positions of the break edges will appear at different, uh, at different wavelengths. So if we set the wavelength in a way that uh, we have a very different attenuation coefficients for the two phases, uh, the tomography experiment will show us uh, the distribution of the two phases because uh, tomography is showing the 3D matrix of the attenuation coefficients. So this is the case here. And you see that in the uh, torted sample where we have torsion, we have some radial dependent uh, phase transition where at the most uh, distant, um, uh, let's say position from the center, we have a uh, phase transition from uh, austenitic to martensitic state due to the fact that in the torsion, we have the highest displacement uh, between two points in the sample in, in, the, in a distance which is far away from the center. So uh, you see that there is some gradient of the phase transition uh, with, uh, with the radius. In the... In the um, uh, sample uh, where we have uh, um, uh, tension, uh, we have the highest stress actually in at the position uh, where uh, uh, we have some, um, uh, let's say, um, deformation of the sample. Uh, and uh, here you can see also uh, the phase transition map uh, in 3D. So this is a very simple method. We need just monochromatic beam. We should find a proper position uh, for our wavelength. And then we have automatically actually uh, the different uh, contrast for the different phases in 3D. So it's very powerful method because the contrast which we observe here is not related anymore just to um, uh, to the uh, different materials, 
but uh, it is related to the different phases, crystallographic phases of, of one material. So um, here, the main feature, which or the main effect, uh, is the, the diffraction contrast or the scattering. So here we we can compare uh, this method with diffraction, and we see actually very good agreement between uh, the signal from the tomography experiment and just uh, a standard diffraction experiment. So the question here is if we can compete the standard diffraction experiment. No, it's not the case because for these samples we were sure that uh, there is no texture in the sample. So coming back to this question, which was uh, uh, asked before, if we have a texture, this means that uh, the signal here uh, or the transmission will depend also on the orientation of the sample, which will um, actually um, produce artifacts uh, in the tomography experiments where we are expecting that the attenuation is only due to the different attenuation coefficients in the sample and not uh, by some uh, orientation dependent effects in the sample, what is the texture. So here, I, I mean, I'll go a bit further. So um, the texture effects can be seen also here where actually we rotate the sample in the monochromatic beam and you can see in the twisted samples um, then uh, that uh, we have uh, just changing of the contrast uh, with the rotation. So uh, here the sample was multiple uh, twisted and uh, this was twisted less at the less degree. So you can see how the contrast in the sample changes uh, in the rotation. So this means that actually uh, the imaging can be used as a complementary uh, uh, method to the diffraction in order to identify which region of the sample can be used uh, for diffraction, for example, because the texture is also a problem in uh, standard diffraction experiments. So here I would like to show more sophisticated method where actually um, we don't use one single wavelength, but take tomographies at different wavelengths then we can uh, actually see the break edges for voxels of our sample for, uh, let's say, uh, a 3D uh, map uh, of uh, the uh, break edges in the sample. And uh, in this way, it is possible, actually, if we select one voxel, it is possible uh, to take the first derivative of the break edge and to find the position of the break edge. So due to the fact that the break edge position is different for austenitic and martensitic states, then we could be much more quantitative and reconstruct actually in 3D the positions of the break edges, which gives us the chance really to estimate the uh, in percentage the amount of one or other phase which is very powerful method. So it's under, invest, uh, under development for the moment. So you see that the paper, the paper is quite recent. So uh, here, another uh, just example. Um, so Steve, do I have three minutes more? I guess. Yeah, I guess so. OK. I'm so really this is quite interesting method because it's archaeology. And archaeology is always very fascinating. So um, we got uh, some Mesopotamian seals to investigate, and we knew that uh, they are produced um, by uh, hematite uh, um, mineral. And uh, from diffraction experiments, uh, it was uh, find out that there is also magnetite uh, amount uh, in, the, in the samples. So it was uh, the question which we had how to identify, in, identify samples containing magnetite in addition to the main material, uh, which is hematite. And is it possible to map the phase distribution uh, of these phases uh, actually in the sample in 3D? So these are the uh, transmission spectra through all the uh, samples. 
And uh, you see that uh, there is some um, uh, very uh, strong break edge at 4.4 uh, uh, angstrom. And only for one sample, uh, this is not really the case. So uh, here we have some different structure. So even in transmission mode, we are sensitive to the uh, crystalline structure of the samples. And it was, it was found out by diffraction that this is calcium carbonate. So there was one, one fake sample, which by monitoring of all the samples was uh, found immediately. So we see also in addition to this, that uh, this uh, main uh, breakage for uh, hematite uh, has some splitting here. And uh, one additional peak appears at five, around five angstrom here, or not peak, but break edge, which can be related to magnetite. Actually, with dashed lines, uh, I put the expected positions of for break edges for hematite, which actually correlates very well to the measured data. And also this uh, line or uh, uh, expected break edge for magnetite is correlating very well with this new break edge here. So what we have done is just we set the wavelength at five angstrom. And then we have uh, completely different attenuation coefficients for uh, magnetite and hematite. So it was possible really to uh, get um, the distribution of the two phases in 3D and be more quantitative in order to estimate the weight uh, percentage, uh, volume percentage actually of the hematite. And uh, here I want to point out that uh, there is another method of um, um, Newton beam monochromatization, the time of flight method, which will be presented more in detail by Robin. So just stay um, uh, awake and uh, after a short break, I think Robin will step in and present this uh, in more detail. So thank you for your attention.